We're delighted to be joined this morning uh, by Thomas Chagru of the Univer University of New York, uh, but originally, as we all know, of Detroit. Uh, so we're delighted to have you with us, uh, Thomas, this morning. Um, as you all know, we're continuing our sacred conversations, conversations that began um, last fall uh, in light of the, the real world that we're living in, a world that continues to be divided, a, continue, a world that continues to be plagued uh, by racism and discrimination, not just overt um, personal racism and discrimination, um, but uh, societal and institutional racism that uh, plagues whole communities and uh, as we've seen at times, uh, a whole nation. Uh, so it's important for us to continue this conversation to explore uh, race, faith, and society today, an opportunity for us to look at um, the real world um, history uh, of racism in America and its con contemporary uh, explore, um, the word I'm looking for, uh, expressions, excuse me, and its contemporary expressions, as well as what we might do to respond to it personally and uh, communally uh, together. Uh, so I'm delighted to continue that conversation today and to welcome uh, to our midst Thomas Segru uh, from the University of New York again. Walter, I'm going to turn it over to you to kick us off and uh, get us started. Thank you, Father Drew. We'll start with prayer and then I'll introduce our guest for today. This is our, one of our prayers of the colic for social justice. The Lord be with you. And also with you. with you. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend, to get, contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression. And that we may reverently use our freedom. Help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations. To the glory of your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you all. It is a great honor to um, introduce our speaker, Professor Thomas Chagru. Um, just a little vignette. Um, one of our responders today, um, Helen uh, Santis, when I came uh, to Christ Church Gross Point in 2018, she gave me a book uh, called The Origins of the Urban Crisis um, by Thomas Chagru and said, this is, your, this is your orientation to what really Detroit uh, is about as far as the history of race. And it, it, it was eye-opening, not in a sense that I didn't know this. I, you know, having grown up in Toledo, considering Cleveland a home and living in Washington, DC and New York City um, close to Baltimore at one time, as well as even San Diego, um, with the exception of Hawaii and South Africa and, the, and in Tennessee, small town and college town in Tennessee, I've lived in urban, large urban cities um, with significant um, African-American populations. Um, and so the, the, not lost on me the irony of moving to Burlington, Vermont the next month, but um, this book was really in the accumulation of the data and the history and merging it with the stories of people, including the stories of Christian churches um, has been really, as well as Jewish synagogues has been really a, an eye-opening part of my experience here in Detroit. So I am just glad to have, um, when we came up with this series, we wanted to at least have one session to be particularly localized, but also see how that local experience relates to a wider universal trend. So um, Tom Chagru um, is currently professor at New York University and director of the Cities Collaborative at that university. And he is one of America's in the world, I'd say, leading scholars on race, civil rights, and cities. He's written four books, working on another, and edited four books. Um, I've mentioned this the book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, Race and Inequality in Post-War Detroit, which has won a lot of awards, including um, the Bancroft Prize for History. Um, his other books, I don't want to embarrass him too much, but one of the books I think is really important that uh, I've started was Not Even Past, Barack Obama and the Burden of Race, 
um, and, and how the 44th president having to step into those waters um, racially um, is in some ways reflective of how we are, of course, struggled the last four years and how, how we're dealing with our issues of race now to this very day. So um, Tom he grew up, was born on the west side of Detroit. And I think he told me at about the age of 11, they moved out to the um, Farmington area. That's not correct. So um, he actually knows this experience firsthand. And I think it's interesting. And he may probably talk about how you, you live an experience and then you go back and study it as a clear eyed and dispassioned academic is interesting uh, exercise. So Tom, we turn it over to you. Um, uh, I know that you, uh, you're a co-host, so you're able to share slides, and I know you have some slides for us, so thank you. Well, thank you very much, Reverend Brownage, for inviting me here. Um, I'm really honored to be speaking uh, to your group. Um, given that we are trapped in COVID times, unable to um, travel, um, this is the next best thing from being back in my hometown. I think this is the longest period in my post-collegiate life that I have not been in my hometown, maybe the longest period ever I haven't been back. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice to be vicariously uh, in the metro area. Um, what I'm gonna do today is um, give you just a quick overview of some of the fundamental questions concerning racial inequality in metropolitan Detroit. By virtue of the format, um, I'm going to be quick. I'm going to rush through a lot of stuff, uh, but I hope I will be clear in my speed. And I hope we'll have lots of time um, in the discussion afterwards for um, me to elaborate on any points um, that you think need elaboration. Um, but I should begin, as, as, as Reverend Brownridge mentioned, um, I'm a native of Detroit. I grew up on the west side. My family um, moved to um, Farmington Township, now Farmington Hills, when I was in fifth grade. Um, and uh, I came back to Detroit um, when I was in graduate school at Harvard to begin um, working on a dissertation. And I didn't have at that time um, any great certainty that Detroit would be my case study, but I was fundamentally interested in questions of race and inequality, um, both in terms of housing markets and in terms of economics. Um, and their impact on everyday life and on politics. Um, and so I returned back to the metropolitan area uh, to do research uh, and um, eventually produced my book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis. But I started that project with a fundamental question and I'm gonna pull up my slides to show you um, kind of graphically the sorts of issues that I um, was considering. So, um, uh, this, is a, this is a photograph that was uh, an aerial photograph taken by the Wall Street Journal for an article on Detroit's housing market that was published in October. They interviewed me for it. Um, and uh, this uh, landscape was probably familiar to, to you, many of you, at least from the ground level. Um, the center of the photograph on the left um, is bifurcated uh, by Alter Road. To the left, uh, Gross Point. To the right, Detroit. One of the fundamental questions that I ask in my work um, and consider the social, economic, and political implications of is what explains landscapes like this? To most people in most of the United States, a landscape like this uh, uh, divided by an invisible line or a visible line, but really an invisible line, um, separating two communities with very similar, at least in this section, very similar uh, lot sizes uh, and architectures. What explains uh, the fact that one on the right has witnessed steady disinvestment and depopulation going on now uh, two thirds of a century uh, and uh, the other has continued to thrive? What explains the fact that the residents of one community that on the right uh, uh, are afflicted by high rates of unemployment, of poverty, of, of, of uh, poor health, uh, and many other afflictions commonly associated with poverty, and the others by and large are not. What explains the fact that on one side of this line, this single road cutting through metropolitan Detroit, on one side, we've got a population that has struggling public schools uh, and crumbling infrastructure, and on the other side, just 
literally, you know, 100 feet away, you have residents living in one of the best school districts in the United States uh, with public services that by the standards of most of the United States are enviable. I asked those questions and also began to think about them in a personal way. Um, about uh, 15 or 20 years ago, um, I visited Detroit with a film crew um, and I took them to uh, a section of Detroit uh, where we could discuss the issues of the transformation of the city over the last uh, half century or three quarters of a century. Uh, I took them to uh, a, a street called Santa Rosa on Detroit's near west side um, between Livernois and Wyoming. Some of you may have been there just south of Fankel Avenue uh, and uh, uh, to the corner of Santa Rosa and Shelfont. This is a fairly typical Detroit neighborhood. 50 or 60 years ago, it was thriving. Uh, it was full of small, single family detached homes uh, that were largely the residences of uh, working class Detroiters. Uh, most of them were um, immigrants or the children of immigrants from various parts of Europe. Among them uh, were my grandparents uh, who had emigrated from Ireland uh, to Detroit in 1923. Um, my grandparents' home in, uh, uh, in that period was still standing. It's now gone. Um, it uh, is basically the vacant lot that we're looking at with the little uh, 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 sidewalk going toward it and the remains of a chain link fence uh, just left of the center of the photograph. Looking at Santa Rosa and Shelfont, I had to ask, one has to ask, what happened to this neighborhood? How did a neighborhood that was a gateway uh, for upwardly mobile immigrants, most of them blue collar, uh, uh, how had it become a place of wide scale abandonment? What explains uh, the fact that in 1950, the Santa Rosa and Shelfont community where my grandparents uh, had their house and where my dad grew up, uh, what explains the fact that in 1950, um, it was a neighborhood with very low rates of unemployment, uh, with very high rates of, uh, of high school completion, which was unusual in working class communities for most of American history. And in 1950, what explains the fact that it was all white? Today, uh, uh, more than half of the residents of this community live beneath the poverty line. They're disproportionately older. Um, they're highly afflicted by disability and disease uh, counted by the census. Um, and um, it, it's a neighborhood that is now nearly entirely African-American. To understand that process of transformation requires really quickly looking at how Detroit uh, metropolitan Detroit and the city of Detroit went from being uh, a boom town, um, the center of American capitalism, indeed maybe the center of global capitalism. It was of course home to the auto industry which employed uh, directly or indirectly one in every six uh, working Americans in the middle of the 20th century. This, uh, for those of you who don't recognize it, um, is maybe the most impressive of all of the auto plants in metropolitan Detroit, the Ford River Rouge plant. Um, it was the center of, uh, of, of the industry, uh, and it was a place that at its peak employed 90,000 workers, doing everything from unloading coal and iron from the ships that docked uh, in uh, the dredged out section of the River Rouge uh, to uh, those who uh, put engines in cars, assembled car chassis, uh, and eventually uh, trimmed them and sent them out to market. Detroit at its peak was one of the richest cities in the world and that wealth can be seen all over today's landscape still in the glorious Art Deco and neoclassical skyscrapers of downtown, um, in uh, the uh, extravagant architecture uh, along Lake St. Clair and Ghost Point or in Palmer Woods or uh, in uh, the northern suburbs. But Detroit was above all uh, a place of opportunity for those who wanted to own their own homes. Its landscape isn't the landscape of New York with high rise tenements or Philadelphia and Baltimore with little cramped row houses. This is a, a city where the vast majority of the population, uh, regardless of their background, lived in single family detached homes like this landscape here on Detroit's east side. Um, you'll notice the, the, the sharp angle near the top of the photograph. Uh, that's Gratiot. Uh, 
uh, uh, the Detroit River is off, uh, of course, uh, at the horizon. Uh, and so this is Detroit's east side, the most densely populated section of the city uh, in 1940, um, uh, when Detroit was at near its peak of population and economic power. Because of the wealth of Detroit, even ordinary Detroiters from a working or lower middle class background were able to own their own homes. And these are just some photographs, uh, one historical, a couple of more contemporary of typical uh, modest sized single family homes uh, in the city. Uh, some neighborhoods, uh, like this neighborhood near the University of Detroit, this is where my mother grew up, uh, uh, were a little uh, more impressive, uh, classic uh, uh, faux Tudor uh, facades, brick facades, substantial, but modest sized homes that were again a sign of the ways in which Detroit was in many respects a place where people could fulfill the American dream of single family home ownership. Today, however, many of those neighborhoods uh, look nothing like what they look like a half century or more ago. This is a photograph taken by a scholar of Detroit who uh, works in Paris, um, uh, who uh, visited the city uh, about uh, 10 years ago or so for her research. Um, this is the east side, the very area that I showed you in the first photograph. Once extraordinarily dense with homes packed cheek by jowl, now essentially reverted to nature. Um, when I have taken a various film crews or colleagues or friends visiting uh, around Detroit on, on tours, I take everyone on a tour of the city, um, I've regularly seen pheasants rising up from the tall grass, uh, much of which isn't mowed during the summer. Large sections of Detroit now have uh, huge tracts of abandoned and empty homes. This is a neighborhood um, on uh, the east side, um, getting close to um, McNichols in Nevada, just off of Woodward, um, uh, an area that was um, very typical of uh, 1920s era Detroit. Again, little bungalows uh, and single family homes. Um, and this is an area uh, uh, on Detroit's west side, uh, where uh, homes left to the elements, uh, once fairly grand homes left to the elements, have very quickly crumbled away. Many of you uh, almost certainly live in older houses. I live in one that was built in the um, 1880s right now. Um, and you know that old houses um, succumb to the elements really quickly. Water especially is the great uh, damager of properties. Um, it seeps through the roof. Uh, it gets into the, 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 the walls and, and the facade, ultimately into the foundation. Um, and houses that are exposed to the elements um, turn very quickly as these houses um, have. In addition, uh, uh, given the precarious state of Detroit's economy, there has been for decades now a whole informal or cottage industry of people who go and strip pretty much anything that has resale value from abandoned houses like these. Detroit experienced an extraordinary population decline in a very short period of time. Uh, it was the fifth largest city in the United States in, at the middle of the 20th century. Um, uh, by 2010, uh, it was down to 700,000. Uh, it, it's likely to be somewhere in the low to mid 600,000s when we get the final version of the 2020 census data released pretty soon. But one of the most fundamental characteristics of metropolitan Detroit is that it is one of the most segregated metropolitan areas in the United States by race. So this is not a place that has just seen a collapse in its housing market, uh, has not just seen decades of decline and abandonment, uh, but has also become a case study uh, in in the separation of people by their superficial physical attributes. So this is a map prepared by um, some of my um, friends, colleagues at the CUNY Graduate Center. They prepared maps like this for um, every major metropolitan area in the United States. Essentially, if you take a look at this map, you'll notice two dominant colors, the rusty orange uh, and blue. Blue is uh, the percent white population. The darker blue it is, the greater the white population is. Orange is African-American. Uh, the uh, darker the orange, uh, the greater um, the African-American population. 
you'll notice taking a look at this vast metropolitan area uh, that uh, the vast majority of African Americans are confined to just a small section of the metro. And this is a familiar uh, demographic narrative to you, but it still uh, is, is, is um, eye-opening to see it represented graphically as in this map. The deep orange area in the center, of course, corresponds almost entirely to the boundaries of the city of Detroit, 139 square miles, uh, a, a city that is a, more than 80% African American. Um, you'll notice also uh, to, uh, to the Northwest, these are um, uh, suburbs, uh, uh, Southfield, uh, Oak Park, and, and, and parts of Farmington Hills um, that have increasingly become magnets for upwardly mobile African Americans. And you'll also notice uh, um, if you look to the right, um, just uh, ab above the gross points, still dark blue here, um, there's an area of orange that's beginning to move into Macomb County. Um, that's East Point. I'll talk a little bit more about East Point in a little while um, because I've spent a fair amount of time there working on a voting rights case a few years ago. So what we see in other words here graphically is a very racially segregated metropolitan area. A, a racially segregated metropolitan area, mind you, in the liberal north, or at least somewhat liberal north, um, in an area, uh, I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in a moment, 60 plus years after the first African-American demands for racial equality, including uh, the right uh, to decent housing, one of the, of the major demands of the civil rights movement. In other words, taking a look, look at this map, we're reminded that despite progress in the African-American freedom struggle and race relations in the United States, we have not overcome. Another map, and I'm just gonna show you a few, um, uh, captures what I showed you above, which is vacant lots in metropolitan Detroit. And this is a map from um, about 10 years ago. Um, the, the areas with, that are in orange or red are the areas with most vacant lots. Um, you'll notice the area uh, adjoining the gross points uh, uh, in part um, has a lot of vacant lots over to the right, lower uh, the right of the map. Um, uh, there'd be a lot more today because of the massive number of uh, for foreclosures as a result of predatory, predatory lending, but also tax foreclosures in Detroit, as well as the ongoing out migration of Detroit residents to nearby suburbs. So I'm really quickly going to talk about how we got here. First, we have a system of residential segregation by race that is baked into real estate practices uh, and into everyday life uh, and into public policy in the metropolitan area. And before I get into the, the bakeness, I shall go back to this map for one more moment and tell you that we have a lot of conventional explanations for why metropolitan Detroit looks like this. You've probably heard most of them. I certainly have and still hear them uh, uh, from time to time. One, Detroit was great until the 1960s when uh, uh, the, uh, the uprising or riot of 1967 tore apart the city uh, and black power politics and identity politics poisoned uh, the political climate in the metropolitan area, uh, alienating whites of goodwill and forcing them out of the city. Another explanation, the auto industry uh, was booming and then it collapsed a result of, uh, of uh, overseas competition uh, and, uh, and the search for cheap labor in other parts of the world. Another explanation and a commonplace explanation, birds of a feather flock together. People live with people they like, like themselves. That premise is based on the notion, a fundamentally flawed notion, as I will show in the next several slides, that uh, race and residence are largely a matter of individual choice. This is something that I'm going to show and, and I hope persuade you uh, is a wholly inadequate explanation. Yes, people do when they have a choice, sometimes live near people like themselves. But we have set up an entire system uh, that essentially restricts choice, restricts freedom for a large segment of our population, mostly people of color and disproportionately African-Americans. We do not have a fair or open housing market. We do not have freedom of choice uh, in our housing market, despite decades of public policies intended to open up opportunities in our housing markets. So let me just quickly talk about a few. Deed restrictions. 
These are restrictions in the deeds of houses or the titles of houses, or sometimes of full subdivisions that restricted the occupancy of a house by non-whites. These were common in every new development built for whites in metropolitan Detroit between 1920 and 1948. If you live in a house built in that period, look at your deed, the language is probably still there. But in 1948, the Supreme Court ruled that deed restrictions, while not illegal as such, could not be enforced. So you couldn't sue your neighbor for uh, renting, leasing, or occupying a house if they were non-white. Real estate practices became increasingly effective in limiting choice in the metropolitan Detroit housing market. The National Association of Real Estate Boards, now known as Realtors, the trademark name, um, had a code of ethics um, first introduced in 1924 that specified that a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. This code of ethics remained intact until about 1950, and then it was modified to take out the members of any race or ethnicity uh, with ostensibly race neutral language, but in practice, real estate brokers did not uh, introduce what they considered to be incompatible groups into predominantly white neighborhoods. This was, in other words, an institutional practice that profoundly shaped and limited people's access to the housing market in our metropolitan area. The National Association of Real Estate Board's textbook uh, even specified this in its code of ethics. And I know uh, that uh, one of the major themes of your series uh, of, of talks is race and ethics. This is a very problematic ethics to be sure, but this was taught to every real estate broker in the middle of the 20th century. Here they describe the incompatible elements uh, that might move into a neighborhood, a bootlegger, who would cause annoyance to his neighbors, a madam, uh, a gangster, or, and this is the most telling language, a colored man of means who was giving his children a college education and thought they were entitled to live among whites. What a cast of characters here, prostitutes uh, 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 and gangsters and criminals and wealthy or somewhat wealthy African-American who had enough money to send his kid to college and had some higher aspirations. This was not on the margins. These were not by and large uh, 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 folks who went home and put on their hoods uh, and burned crosses. These were some of the most respected members of their communities abiding by this rather unethical code of ethics. And of course, I will just mention this to you briefly, but most of you are familiar with the gross point point system, uh, which was used to ascertain um, until the early 1960s, the worthiness of prospective buyers uh, in the various gross points. Um, it was targeted um, specifically towards groups that um, historians have called not quite white, groups that came from Southern or Eastern Europe um, or the Middle East. Uh, and uh, required an investigation, uh, sometimes with a private detective going to their home and interviewing their neighbors to ascertain their Americanness uh, and to rank them on a, a number of metrics, including um, how their, whether their names were typically American or what their ethnic background was, um, how they kept their houses, even if they hung laundry out in their yard, which would be a strike against them, uh, how they dressed, uh, and um, uh, and, and most notably, whether their skin was very medium, slightly, or not at all swarthy. In other words, how white did they appear? These categories uh, were reflected in uh, federal uh, policy. Um, and here we see a map of metropolitan Detroit um, that was prepared by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. These are colloquially known as redlining maps. But essentially these ideas of racial superiority and racial difference were baked into bankers and lenders practices. And so the federal government working with local real estate brokers and bankers prepared maps of metropolitan areas. This is Detroit in 1939. These maps were updated um, from time to time. Um, but you'll note, um, uh, if you look off to the right, you'll see um, the gross points are a nice healthy green color um, or, um, or, or blue. 
Um, and uh, you'll notice that large sections of Detroit are red and yellow. Let's just focus on the red color here. Um, areas that were graded D are colored red on the map were considered undesirable. Any African Americans who lived in these areas who were not live-in servants, uh, uh, any African Americans would lead a neighborhood to be ranked D. Of course, there were African Americans living in the gross points uh, in 1939 um, as domestics uh, in, in ho house. That was fine. They were confined to a very clear uh, relationship with whites uh, uh, living in the homes or uh, in outbuildings of the homes of well-to-do whites. But if they weren't, even the presence of a single African American family would lead appraisers to knock down the rating of a neighborhood. They also considered other factors, the quality of the housing uh, uh, and the class of the residents. But these maps to a great extent became prophetic. That is, uh, uh, it was hard for folks to get access to conventional mortgages and loans if they lived in red or even yellow neighborhoods, whereas those living in blue and green neighborhoods um, had no problem for the most part getting access to conventional mortgages and loans to purchase or improve their homes. This is just a close up um, showing you the area around downtown, which is the little trapezoid near the bottom, um, just to give you a sense of the extensiveness of this geography. It should also be said that yellow and red neighborhoods were often neighborhoods with working class uh, Southern and Eastern European residents, uh, Poles, Italians, and Jews uh, in particular. Um, uh, and uh, um, that those classifications were reflected in um, maybe sharpest form in the gross point, point system. This led to the construction sometimes of literal walls that divided neighborhoods. Um, at Eight Mile in Wyoming, a developer of a new subdivision for whites was able to get access to federally backed loans uh, on the condition that he build a six foot high, foot thick cement wall that separated uh, a predominantly African-American section uh, that had been settled in the 1920s with an undeveloped area that was going to be built for whites. The wall still stands. Um, neighborhoods on both sides are now African American. It wasn't uh, particularly effective, but it runs for a half a mile between Pembroke and Eight Mile Road uh, on uh, Detroit's west side in the eight, what we call the Eight Mile Wyoming neighborhood. This is a great picture taken by a, a, a federal photographer in 1941, showing children standing along that wall on the African-American side. It's such a great photo. I could spend an hour talking about this photo, its composition. Um, the fact that the, the, the little black girl second uh, to the left is holding uh, a, a white doll. There's so much to be read in this photograph, but it is a reminder of the ways in which uh, racial boundaries were sometimes created by law and by real estate practices, but also made real in the form uh, of, uh, of architecture uh, and this wall. So what do we see happening in the period when African-Americans beginning to move into Detroit? Massive white resistance to neighborhood change. This is from Detroit's East Side in 1950, a neighborhood organization gathering to fight what they called the invasion of their neighborhood by color. Um, I found more than 200 such organizations emerging in uh, Detroit uh, between uh, the end of the Second World War and the middle of the 1960s. These organizations gathered residents, picketed and protested against the movement of uh, uh, African Americans into their neighborhoods, defended their neighborhoods whiteness, um, and sometimes engaged in violent attacks on the African Americans who moved in. I discovered, for example, in my research on Santa Rosa and Shelfont, my grandparents' neighborhood, um, much to my surprise, uh, that my great uncle uh, was uh, one of the founding members of one of these neighborhood associations uh, uh, in that area in the early 1950s. The first African-American family attempted to move into Santa Rosa and Shelfont in 1953. Uh, a huge crowd, I don't know if my relatives were in it or not, gathered in front of the house picketed and protested, broke windows, which was the most common form of protest because it could be done at night under the cover of darkness and drove the African-American family away. It would be 10 more years, 1963, when the first African-American family successfully moved into that neighborhood. And then it changed very rapidly to become an all 
African American community by 1970. But even more significant in drawing those boundaries and reinforcing those boundaries of race was the process of suburbanization. And Detroit was on the cutting edge of this. These are just a couple of photographs um, uh, just to ca capture the nature of suburbanization, sometimes grand, sometimes modest. Uh, but over the course of the post Second World War II years, suburbanization, which happened for a variety of reasons, not all having to do with flight, uh, nonetheless was an overwhelmingly white process. Regardless of why whites moved to the suburbs, maybe it was because they wanted bigger lawns or better schools. Maybe it was because uh, uh, they had friends or relatives who had moved there ahead of them. Uh, maybe it was because uh, it was closer to work or more convenient. Maybe they were expressing their upward mobility by buying a better house. Regardless of the reasons, this process was largely closed to African Americans and largely to uh, remains uh, in fundamental ways restricted by race even up until today. Classic post Second World War II photograph. These come from a series of photographs of uh, family photos of metropolitan Detroit. I don't know what suburb this is, unfortunately, um, but it could be anywhere. The process of suburbanization and segregation leads to what one sociologist powerfully calls opportunity or resource hoarding. That is, people who live in uh, suburban areas, and these are school districts in metropolitan Detroit, um, uh, can uh, uh, move to places with exceptional goods and resources, especially public goods like education. To a great extent, because education and many other public goods in the United States are distributed locally, where you live determines a lot about your future. It determines uh, what kind of job you're going to get, whether you're gonna have good access to jobs. It determines all sorts of dimensions of quality of life, but especially um, it determines the quality of your education. And educational resources are profoundly maldistributed across metropolitan Detroit because of residential segregation by race. Most African Americans in metropolitan Detroit go to school in uh, only 10 of nearly 100 school districts in the large metropolitan area. And of them, most of them just attend school in three districts. So what we see here, in other words, is a, a world that no civil rights activist could have imagined uh, uh, when Brown versus Board of Education ruled that separate une unequal education was unconstitutional, that nobody fighting for racial equality in the middle of the 20th century could have envisioned. Which is despite the fact that we do not have laws that uh, forbid racial mixing in schools, as was the case in much of the country in 1950, we still have a system of public education profoundly divided by race, still separate and unequal. Civil rights activists uh, led the fight for racial equality in housing, and Detroit was one of the centers of that activism. I've written about this in another book called Sweet Land of Liberty, which is on the history of civil rights in the North. Um, this is a 1963 protest downtown in front of the Civic Center uh, demanding equal housing. Um, and of course, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was a key figure in this as he moved his activism from Alabama and Georgia um, northward. Um, he found actually greater resistance, particularly around the issue of housing in the North than he ever had in the South. In 1968, after lots of pressure, um, the federal government passed the Civil Rights Act of 68, uh, which forbade discrimination in housing, um, outlawing racially discriminatory practices but there still remain all sorts of obstacles. And I'm gonna end just by giving you a few of them and then we can go into discussion. First, and this is very, very common and has been documented um, as recently as last year uh, by researchers, real estate discrimination, specifically steering. Steering is uh, directing white buyers to predominantly white neighborhoods and directing non-white buyers to racially mixed or predominantly minority neighborhoods. 
when I bought my first house in Philadelphia in my early 30s, um, uh, when I bought my first house in Philadelphia, I had a wonderful real estate broker, a 60 something woman, experienced in the industry, sweet, smart, great to work with. Um, she was actually very active in um, uh, uh, one of the most prestigious Episcopal churches in the Chestnut Hill section of Philadelphia. Um, I loved her, she was wonderful. But on one of our, our visits, we requested to look at a particular house um, and she used a euphemism, do your neighborhood research. She could not, under civil rights law, tell me about the racial composition of the residents of that neighborhood. She could not give me that kind of data or she would violate the tenets of the Fair Housing Act. But I knew and she knew exactly what she meant. She was engaged in a subtle process of steering, working within the boundaries of existing real estate law. Recently, a study of steering in Long Island suburbs of New York showed that uh, it's still going on in really significant numbers. Um, and uh, a, a, a one real estate broker um, told a potential white buyer, um, when you're looking in that neighborhood, go at the end of the school day and go to the school bus stops and observe uh, who's there. Uh, look at the mothers. Um, again, not saying anything about the racial composition of a neighborhood, but making it very clear to the potential buyer uh, that she might not uh, want to live in that particular community. Predatory lending and racial discrimination in, in mortgages is still common. I'm not going to talk about that now because we're, um, I'm getting near to the end of my time, except for to say uh, that um, uh, all sorts of predatory lending, uh, uh, which the Wall Street Journal um, article wrote about, continue to play out, particularly in predominantly minority communities. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, despite the fact that Detroit has an, an overwhelming African-American population, there continue to be racial disparities in home lending. Um, African-Americans um, still uh, 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 are underrepresented in the home loan market for all sorts of reasons that I can explain later, limiting their access uh, to fair housing uh, in the city and beyond. And of course, uh, the problem of foreclosures and vacancy disproportionately affects neighborhoods with people of color. And this is a map of tax foreclosures in metropolitan Detroit. Shocking. When I show this map to people from other parts of the country, they can't believe that the magnitude of, uh, of official foreclosures in metropolitan Detroit, nearly 150,000, um, which is a staggering figure by, by any standard. Um, and now we come back again to where we began. Um, the Detroit gross point. Sorry, there's not an E at the end of point, my, my bad typo. Um, uh, um, back to the same photographs that we began with. To understand this map, to understand the divisions between city and suburb, to understand the racial disparities that plague metropolitan Detroit and most of urban America, we need to look back at that long historical process. To understand that it's not just a matter of individual choice. It's not just a matter of stone cold racists acting on their racist impulses. Rather, it's a matter of, uh, of the long legacies of discriminatory practices and their perpetuation through taken for granted like real estate practices and lending practices. The consequence is that, that one of the greatest disparities in the United States today um, is the disparity uh, uh, of household wealth and I'll end with this point. Most Americans uh, get most of their wealth from their property, from their real estate. African Americans have uh, over the last 10 years between five and 10% the household wealth of white Americans. Why? Because they tend to live in communities that have suffered disinvestment. Why? Because wealth is also passed down from generation to generation. Uh, and those disparities in wealth mean disparities and all sorts of other outcomes. Your college attendance, your ability to save and, and have money in case of an emergency, and what you pass down to your children in the form of an inheritance. All of these disparities, highly visible in metropolitan Detroit, are at the very core of understanding the depth and persistence of racial inequality in America. Martin Luther King, uh, in his most quoted phrase, talked about the necessity of overcoming. We shall overcome. Today, uh, more than 50 years after his assassination, we have not yet overcome. We have in certain arenas. 
we're not living in the world of 1968, but we have still a lot of overcoming to do. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Father Drew, did you want to start? Sure. Or are you still process? Well, <laughs> With, oh. oh, I'm uh, processing myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, a lot there. Um, a lot. Uh, I, I, as as we were concluding, as, as you were concluding, Tom, I was I was noting how much um, you have shared with us in the in the span of a half an hour. Uh, ten. I haven't counted them up. Ten different significant r root causes of the division. Uh, that we still uh, experience today, um, that division that uh, you, you leave us with reminding that we have not overcome all that stood between us um, as an American society 50, uh, 60, 70 years ago. Um, so what, what one of the things that struck me was that uh, I think I would. I think it would be safe to say I was aware of all of these pieces, in some intellectual um, and disparate way. But to consider them in as connected and integrated a way um, was both um, not necessarily new, um, but daunting. Uh, and, and nearly overwhelming. Uh, so to, to, to Walter's point, um, yeah, still taking it in um, uh, even, even now. There was one slide um, early on that had a phrase in it, kind of quietly in there, that I think summed up so much of what we've been exploring throughout um, these uh, eight weeks of seven or eight weeks, whichever it may be, of sacred conversation. It was, it was in your second slide on, on realtor ethics, uh, in which it was the slide in which we had bootleggers and a madam, um, a gangster, uh, and a colored man. And in the secondary uh, paragraph, it said, a form of blight. Mm -hmm. Uh, that um, we went from not, not just styles of life, shall we say, to a whole category, cate category of people who were a form of blight on American society. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, I, I've recently heard some, someone critiquing um, identity politics as a rather modern phenomena, something that began in the 60s and continued with, with the feminist movement. And, and, and that statement it just jumped out as a reminder that identity politics have been a part of our society actually from the very beginning. Uh, and that we have categorized a whole people, um, what African-Americans, um, uh, stand out in particular, but by no means only African-Americans, Latinos, as we, we spoke about uh, a couple of weeks ago, Asian Americans in other ways, certainly indigenous uh, uh, Americans, be it Native, uh, Native American Indian or um, Native Hawaiian, Alaskan Aleut, uh, you know, these communities that have been a form of blight on our identity as an American people. Um, and, and how do we transform not just the words on the page, um, but uh, the, the impetus of our heart that sees another as just that, a blight upon us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and along that line, I was, I was equally struck, and I, I, this is just a quick technical question. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, that the deeds that um, we started with, we started with deed restrictions, um, that we can go back and look at um, our deeds and, uh, and, and, and find that language. Not being a homeowner here in Gross Point, is that, is that an 
is that true? Is that actually true? I mean, it, I would be curious about the deeds that we have at Christchurch. That that language remains in the deeds of of properties, um, and that if we were to pull them up, we would see this language still today, even though it's not enforceable. Yes, um, I'll, I want to answer your first two questions too. But let me just, since that's a technical one, I can answer it quickly. Yeah. The answer is yes. Um, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes um, written into um, the uh, uh, to the subdivision itself, and so your deed might not include that specific language, but it will refer to um, language for the entire subdivision or development. But more or less. Um, uh, the majority of developments in, in the metropolitan area built in the first half of the 20th century, broadly speaking, especially after 1920, um, have some form of racial restriction written in them. And um, there are undoubtedly a few lawyers um, in this crowd. Um, and you lawyers will know that, I mean, will we'll, we'll of course know this, that um, extricating that language from a title or a deed requires um, it, it, it's, it's not easy, right? It, it, it's a legal process. You can't just run a line through it and then you know, pass the deed on in the future. You've got to um, go through a legal process. There's a, group of, um, uh, there's a group of academics in Seattle and Washington led by James Gregory, who's a wonderful history professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. He created something called the Seattle Labor and Civil Rights Project. And he had his undergraduate students do research on racially restrictive covenants in metropolitan Seattle. And they did a whole website and documented thousands of these. Um, but then they used that information to go to the um, Washington state legislature um, to enact a law that made it possible for people to strike that language from their deeds um, without having to go through a, a, a costly um, legal process. Um, so it's possible to modify the law in ways that make it possible. But Otherwise, they remain um, uh, in many titles and deeds um, to properties. Um, I, I, I was just recently talking to somebody from Cranbrook, where I'm going to be giving a talk in um, the spring. Um, they acquired a house in Bloomfield Hills um, designed by the famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright. And the language in the, the, the title for that house is super restrictive. It's some of the strongest language that I've ever seen. The house was built in... Um, a subdivision that was restricted um, beginning, I think, in the late 1920s. That was built in 1950. But the language is still there, and it's super strong, and it referred to Semites and, 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 and uh, people of African descent, and, and you know, it had very, very laden language. Um, so these are not um, flukes. They're, they're not a bug. They're a feature of um, the real estate system in this period. And so I would say definitely to have, have a look at if your house is built before 1900. Um, it's probably not going to be there. And, in, and if it was built after 1948, unless it was built in the subdivision with restrictions, um, it may not be there either because they were unenforceable at that point. Gotcha. Fascinating. Um, so that's a that's a technical one we're going to have to look at. I'd be very interested to see um, the deeds of, of Christchurch properties uh, and what what that says about our history. Um, both as a church and as a community of Gross Point, as a little view into our world, uh, but particularly str str um, struck by uh, that language of blight uh, and personification of it uh, in a way that, um, again, aware of, no, but your presentation drew that, um, drew a circle around that in a very prominent way, and I was grateful for that. And uh, I, just to reinforce your two points about blight and about identity politics, um, the, the framework of blight is a newish one when it comes to understanding real estate in cities. It emerges in the 20th century. I mean, blight is a, is a, is a, is a mildew, is a, is a, is a, it's a plant disease, right? Um, and so the very word makes it sound like this is just part of the natural order of things. And that's one reason why race and racial ideologies are so hard on root because we think they're just, it's just how things are. It's just the natural order of things. Um, um, but sociologists and, and others working on race all the way up to the present day um, find that um, the visible presence of non-whites on streets uh, or in houses 
immediately has effects uh, on how that neighborhood or that house is perceived. In fact, it's commonplace advice among real estate brokers that if you're an African American um, selling in a neighborhood that is predominantly white, that the first thing you do when you're staging your house for sale is you take all of your family pictures down um, because uh, uh, people will offer less for the house or not consider it because they, they, they associate um, the presence of a non-white with um, lesser value, right? Or with blight in effect. Um, so these legacies um, are really deeply rooted to the point of where they just become part of the taken for granted of how we, how we look at places and understand others and ourselves. Mm -hmm. Second point about identity politics, one of the arguments I've been making, and I make in this book implicitly, but have made more explicitly in other work, we have an unacknowledged white identity politics in the United States that's been around for a really long time, right? You see that crystal clear in the gross point point system, right? Um, Americanness is associated with the color of your skin. You're not American if you're very swarthy, right? Um, right? There's a, there, there are all sorts of assumptions about identity um, that, um, again, are part, usually part of the not said, part of the taken for granted, um, part of the assumed that continue to shape even the thinking of people of goodwill. That's why these things are so deeply rooted. I mean, yes, we have, and we've seen them out in force and, and you know, in, in recent weeks, in the last couple of years, you know, hardcore white racists, but we make a terrible, terrible mistake, a mistake that has really significant moral implications, right? Implications for the kind of work that you are doing. Um, we make a terrible, terrible mistake if we just write off um, racial inequality as a product of folks who, um, you know, uh, visit the Proud Boys websites or identify with neo-Nazis. Um, uh, that's not the real problem. I mean, it is a problem and we need to uproot them and, and get rid of them. The real problem is that all the taken for granted, right? All the assumptions that we don't even question um, that shape how we understand and see the world. Yes, yes. Um, and, and as you say, that we take for granted, uh, we are entirely unaware of uh, these, uh, uh, that, the, the reality of the deed language um, points to a reality that race is buried deep within our um, collective society in places we're not even aware it exists, or I should say racism ex exists deep, uh, deeply embedded within our society in places we're entirely unaware, but still has lingering impacts and um, upon who we are. There's a famous study, and this gets to something I only briefly talked about today, but I could talk about forever, um, employment and race. Um, there's a famous study, I think the University of Chicago economists who did, um, who, who, who did something called testing. You do two identical candidates for a job. One has a demonstrably African-American sounding name um, and another has a white name. They have identical credentials, educational credentials, work experience, um, recommendations, uh, and the white, the white named candidate was far more likely to be interviewed than the African named candidate, right? Regardless, again, I mean, regardless of civil rights laws, regardless, right, it, it becomes what, what economists call signal uh, to an employer. Uh, and, and those signals um, uh, up on a high frequency, not heard by that many people, um, but you know, still play a really central role in how um, racial inequality persists in the United States today even again, among people who might otherwise be well-meaning. Amen. Yeah. I don't want to take up all of our, our, our dialogue time, but I want to make sure and bring Walter in. You've been patient, Walter. Love to have your thoughts and, um, as, as, we, as we engage uh, today's conversation. Thank you. And Professor, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, between your presentation and um, that slide, uh, um, about the, the gangster, the prostitute, the um, uh, others, and, and, but then including a colored man of means who could send, is just very profound. But um, it, it relates to something I saw as a, th that's one piece of it is the theme of the book about just white identity and white hostility and how you tie it to this Americanist is one theme. Mm -hmm. um, that strikes me. And I particularly find that, I find that striking because as the son of a World War II veteran um, who many of the ben veteran benefits, um, we were talking yesterday as a group, uh, were 
you know, black veterans were not able to get the same benefits that fellow white veterans got coming back after World War II to this. And, and that sets up, um, you know, part of the housing problem because they, you know, in some ways they could have helped their families get a leg into or earlier into the middle class as their white colleagues did. Mm -hmm. And that whole, that just that whole sense. And, you know, part of your book talks about, um, you know, I think a lot of Episcopalians in Michigan, you know, um, at least more liberal, are glad that in the, you know, G. Menon Williams was governor during the 50s and, you know, the Kennedy administration was an Episcopalian. Some, some of our older members remember him. But um, a lot of that work, um, even when Michigan would pass a law like that in the 50s, and there was one example, it didn't really help in that way. And, and likewise, the struggle around fair housing. Um, and you showed how, how, and I think that's actually a theological point, um, how uh, the real estate industry, industry adapts to those changes. So that's just one piece that just really struck me about how difficult it is to get at, and, you know, and the moral question is, why is that, that there is an association of, quote, blight from a black person who may even have higher income than their prospective white neighbors, but that fear, because that. But the other piece of the book that struck me, your book on the roots of the urban crisis was actually how the Christian churches and to some degree Jewish synagogues responded to the push for integration. Um, actually, the most interesting, maybe in the book pages 192 and 193, on one side talks about gross point and the point system, and the other thing talks about the respective way either Protestants or Roman Catholics dealt with integration. You know, Congregationalists, you pointed out, and Presbyterians and Baptists and Reform, it was easy for them to leave the city. If their members started, you know, saying, we're going to leave a changing neighborhood, they would flee. Roman Catholics were tied to this, the parish system mm -hmm. in the city. Um, and, you know, I have friends that often talk about the Roman Catholics were in some ways the last to leave. They may have spread to the suburbs because they, they did build churches in the suburbs where members were, but they would often keep their parishes in. And to some degree, the Episcopalians did as well, as well as spreading to the suburbs, of course. But I find that interesting is that there's this moral disconnect because you had leadership, uh, Cardinal Mooney, um, one of the, you know, John Coogan, who taught at University of Detroit mm -hmm. and others promoting, you know, racial equality and yet getting hate, they would get hate mail from Catholics. Um, and others would be challenged and that the local priests, some of them felt threatened um, that their parish life would be threatened if their neighborhoods became integrated because they would not say, what neighborhood are you in? It's what parish mm -hmm. that be mm -hmm. over. But the last, and then the last piece of it is how the homeowners associations often found a way in to, to start a homeowners association in a Detroit neighborhood was through um, the, uh, the, the parish social system, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, and again, to me, this is the interesting question about <laughs> our faith and how it supposedly should lead us and yet it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if in your research, did you get any interviews? Like were some of these folks still living who could tell their experiences? I'm curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a great set of questions. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the role of religion and how people understand community and, and urban space. And uh, and you're you're absolutely right in your reading of my analysis that um, if you if you have a territorial identity, if you say I, I live in Saint Rita's, I live in Our Lady of Sorrows, I live in um, then your 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 the boundaries are clear. Right, you you create a sense of community not just based on the fact that you gather for worship on Sunday, but that you live in a, a territory that defines often where your kids go to school and where you worship and the networks that you're a part of. And so 
losing that is really challenging, right? If you, if you move from one Catholic parish to another, you're giving up that parish and you're going to another one. Um, and uh, um, by contrast, many Protestant and Jewish congregations draw from a wide geographic area. You don't need to live within the boundaries of the parish. And so they could move and they did move um, and didn't have that same sense of, of link to place. And that's really important. But this gets to a fundamental question. I'm being like really big picture here, right? What does community mean? We love community. We celebrate community. You're creating a community in your parish. We, we, we're all part of different communities. You know, the parish community, the African-American community, the neighborhood community, et cetera. Um, but um, communities have two sides and we need to be really attentive to the positive side of community, which is it creates lots of important ties and bonds between us that are essential for living a, a moral, just social life. And then on the other hand, communities also can be exclusive. You draw lines, who's in and who's out. And much of the story of, of Detroit is a story of strong communities like Catholic parishes say, um, but also communities where you draw sharp lines and say, you're not in my community, you're somebody else. You define them out, you call them a blight, you call them dangerous, you consider them other, or you draw a, an invisible line of city, suburb, school district boundary, et cetera, and say, you can't be in mine, right? So the fundamental thing that we have to grapple with in thinking about race is how do we challenge these boundaries? How do we widen the sense of we, right? Who we are, how mm. is the notion of we a more inclusive and encompassing one, not a narrow and exclusive one? Because the communities that we're a part of should be communities that are open to, to uh, you know, to, to a broader definition of, of, of our, our, of our identity than they are mostly right now. How do we, how do we broaden the sense of we? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, we are, I, yeah, Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's, 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 it's just, um, uh, I know we want to get to the responders and, and my point is just actually something about our podcast about Brooklyn schools and that issue, um, mm -hmm. of, who is we and uh, the hoarding question, but it's not important. Thank Go you. ahead and make it. Good question. No, no, it's, I, I recommend. No, it, it's the, the question is really that 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 we is the, seems to be the issue. There's a podcast called Nice White Parents, and it actually is about a, a a school, one of the school districts in Brooklyn, and how difficult it is to um, develop and maintain integration, and the. the the reporter who is also a Brooklyn parent in school um, figured out that it's a lot about that hoarding, hoarding of that privilege and wanting to take that privilege even when you go into essentially a gentrifying neighborhood and, and, and wanting to displace those who, who in those parts of Brooklyn as he was talking about, um, African-American and, and uh, Latino communities and so it's just that and and part of it is exactly that it's it, it even becomes a, a we and and them issue we are the nice we're nice white liberal people but we want a certain kind of quality and privileges for our kids and the them are the the families who have who have value education just as much but have different circumstances, including such simple things as um, parents who work. And so a PTA that meets when families are working is gonna be difficult, but I don't wanna digress more into that, but anyway. It's... Yeah, well, let me, let me say, I mean, this is a question that affects many of us personally, or you know, for folks who are older in, uh, in the audience, maybe affected you in the past, but you know, I have, I have uh, uh, four children to my, my, my kids and two stepchildren. My, my children um, went to Philadelphia public schools and graduated from a high school that is majority non-white. Um, and uh, they did just fine. Um, my daughter just graduated from Columbia. My son's a sophomore at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I mean, they, they, they did not um, suffer for being in a woefully underfunded public school district because they came to the classroom with a lot of parental resources, right? Um, two parents with doctorates, uh, you know, uh, a, a very rich uh, educational environment from their, from their young childhood. 
Um, and now I have two stepdaughters, um, not being nice and quiet upstairs, um, who are both in New York public schools, um, one in high school and one in uh, middle school. And, uh, and these kinds of questions come up all the time and they come up in really intense ways because of the involvement of children and our, our hopes and aspirations for our kids. Um, uh, and so, you know, they raise a lot of really important questions, but I think we always have to ask ourselves, as I did when I had a discussion with my children um, uh, about their schooling, and as, as my wife and I talk about schooling options for the middle school daughter, especially um, here in New York, um, we, ha we have to ask our ourselves the question, um, what can we do um, to both provide an extraordinary educational opportunity for our children and um, grapple with the fact that we are in a very unequal system. And in New York public schools are the most segregated in the United States or among the most yeah. segregated. Yeah. Um, and our answer, our answer is, as with my, my older kids, the answer is going to a racially mixed school was extraordinary for my kids. They have a vision of the world that is powerful, that has continued to shape how they relate to people and how they think about um, their futures, their vocations, their, their, their life. Um, my daughter in particular, um, and uh, um, you know, she was the co-captain of a debate team with a kid who lived in a, 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 a tumble down row house in West Philadelphia um, with his aunt. Um, uh, and um, that connection that those two kids made was for my daughter and for her, her debate partner, um, extraordinary, and and it, it it it's as good as any AP um, English class or or any um, advanced calculus class um, that they weren't able to take uh, um, uh, because of the limitations of the curriculum in their school, um, and it it I think it actually makes makes my kids more interesting than a lot of their classmates because they bring to to school a whole layer of experiences, and so we need to think about we need to try to put together our our discussion, our, our considerations of our own interests, our own children's interests, so what we perceive is best for them, and um, their, their larger place in society. And we know, based on the last four years and the intense racial hostility that's been rising up everywhere, that racial separation is not good for our politics. It's not good for our sense of community nationwide. It's not good um, on so many levels. And so as I think about my responsibility as a dad slash stepdad, I'm also thinking, how am I gonna equip my kids to go out into the world and make it a more just and equitable place than the one that they're living in now? And fortunately, a lot of them are thinking about that really now too, in really important ways. Um, uh, it gives me the youngsters, youngsters, it sounds like such an old man way of calling them. Um, young people, <laughs> young people give me a lot of hope actually, um, uh, especially young people who've grown up in a world more diverse than the one that many of us and I grew up in. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for, for that and so much. I want to take, uh, take a moment to bring some others into our conversation. We're fortunate uh, every week to have a, a few responders from within our, within our community who, um, who are invited. And, and I, so I want to introduce our responders today. We have um, uh, Jean and Dave Redfield, uh, Helen Santees, uh, and Wendy Richards. They probably should be somewhere towards the front of the, 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 the you gallery. I'm here, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I, we'll probably go, uh, maybe we'll go right to left this time on, on, on my computer. Uh, but what do we hear, what, how have you responded? How have you, perhaps what's new uh, and insightful for you in, in our conversation today? But always, uh, I'd love uh, on a personal level, if you could sp also speak to what's challenging and what's hopeful within our conversation. Um, you know, uh, this, the, the information about discrimination and racism in American society is not new for us. And as we talked about, uh, even throughout, um, th the change that we need to have in a society is not just an intellectual awareness, but a personal transformation. Uh, so those questions of hope and challenge, um, I, I think, are, are significant for us to, to acknowledge uh, within our conversation as well. So, um, Wendy, you happen to be on my right. So, I'm, as I said, I, we're going to go right to left today. Um, so, I'd love to hear and invite you in uh, to our conversation today. Um, so thank you, thank you, Father and uh, Father Drew, and, and thank you, Father Walter, and 
Um, thank you so much, Professor Shagru, for being here. Um, it's just a wonderful honor to have you, and we're really delighted that you were able to, to come. Um, I have so many things I'd like to talk to you about, but I know I have a little bit of time. Um, so in terms of, of, of how Father Drew phrased this, the, the challenge and the hope, um, I, the, the, the definition of community um, certainly, I think, is one that's really difficult in terms of, of those bonds and how we all um, connect in ways that, in some ways, almost become definitively us and them. And, and, and that, that, I think, is a struggle and a challenge. I'm not, I'm not really sure how we get around and how, as a, as a community, a church community, how we work to get around. And I think these conversations do help quite a bit. But there's a lot more, I think, that needs to be done just fundamentally in how humans think about the world and how we think about each other. Um, and and, and there's that tension, I just I think, is enormous. Um, one thing that gives me hope, though, um, again, having conversations like this, and even, even recently, as of last March, I went to um, a racial equity um, conference in Chicago run by the Shriver Center, and that was pulling together professionals who literally, this is part of our job is to work on these issues. And many of them didn't understand the, the issues of redlining in Detroit and all of what you've discussed. And now that's so much a part of our conversation. I think a lot of us have really um, em embraced and understood that. That word is really getting out about how Detroit is not as an example of what's going on around the country or has gone around the country in the North and that this is something that's so systemic. I think that's becoming a lot more, um, there's a lot more awareness about that. And I do think there's a lot of hope about that. And I do think that you and your work is, is seminal on this. So, so thank you so much. I do have a question though, and I hope it doesn't take up too much time. You raised something about the voting rights case in East Point. And I'm really interested to hear more about that. I mean, race, issues of, of you know, racial injustice and voting rights and access to the ballot are so intertwined. And, and I really want to, know a bit about that work if you could spend a minute about that i'd appreciate it yeah and, uh, great. Thank you. um great great comments i mean i i i would just say um i'll put an exclamation point on uh, everything you said from the importance of rethinking community to um the critical um engagements with these questions like redlining right we can't we can't sweep them under the rug we have to confront them head on and think about what they mean for for ourselves, but also for politics and public policy. How do we how do we grapple with these issues and and and, and solve the problem? So I'm very excited to hear that. Um, East Point was a really interesting case. I've served as an expert witness on a number of uh, civil rights cases over the years: a predatory lending case in Detroit, um, a voting rights case, three voting rights cases, one in Euclid, Ohio, a suburb of Cleveland, um, one that just just ended um, uh, in the fall. Um, in Islip, Long Island, uh, uh, involving Latinos in a, a, a suburban area of New York, and then the third, um, East Point. East Point was a case that was um, brought um, by the U.S. Department of Justice at the very end of the Obama administration and continued, maybe improbably, um, as the um, composition of the Department of Justice changed um, and was eventually um, settled in 2019. But uh, East Point, as many of you know, is a suburb that was overwhelmingly white. Um, contiguous with Detroit um, that in the um, early 90s renamed itself East Point to associate with you guys uh, uh, and, uh, and to change its, its kind of reputation. Um, but um, it became like many of what I call secondhand suburbs, um, like an older declining suburb falling out of popularity with younger whites. It began to attract African-Americans wanting to get access to better schools, better, better public services, et cetera. Um, and at the time of the case, it was about a third African-American. It's, it's, I'm sure the African-American population has grown since. Um, but there were zero African-American elected officials in the town. And a long history, as I uncovered from my expert report for the case, of explicit discrimination, including and racially restrictive covenants, um, but also um, by, by apartment building uh, uh, landlords in the town who, um, in, as late as the 90s, refused to show houses to African American or apartments to African Americans to um, the town, which was involved in various discrimination suits for not hiring any African Americans, um, to finally um, um, a whole series of incidents um, involving racial profiling and policing going back to the 1990s, um, all of which made African Americans um, feel unwelcome in the community, but all of which also um, 
weren't, weren't um, mitigated by the growth of the African-American voting age population because of the way the town was structured. Um, they didn't have any representation in the city council or in other um, uh, elected offices in the city or in city agencies. Um, and so while African-Americans are growing, they don't really have a voice in their local government. And so the suit was to try to change the, um, the, the, the voting system from an at-large system to a district system so that African-American section of town um, would get representation in the city council. And eventually uh, that, that suit succeeded. The town entered into a, uh, a settlement with uh, the Department of Justice and, and reorganized its, its voting system so that there are now African-Americans who hold office. And um, Euclid, same way, right? About Euclid was even more African-American, um, but had zero African-American elected officials. And Islip in Long Island, um, a huge place, you know, more than 300 and 310,000 people, a third of whom were Latino, and zero Latino elected officials because they were all elected at large, which meant that whites voted for whites um, and didn't vote for Latinos. And there weren't enough Latino voters to, to pull Latino candidates over the top, even though they were a very, very sizable member of the community with very distinctive political needs. So representation and voting rights matters really matters, right? In terms of making sure that your community has a voice in, in local governance and access to lots of other things that come with having political power, like jobs and, and, and other opportunities. So it was a really important case. I'm, I'm really proud to have worked on it. I also know more about East Point than probably, dare I say, not to brag, anybody in the world. <laughs> uh, uh, spent a fair amount of time there doing research. Thank you uh, again, Wendy, for your comments. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. And, and I, I want to just keep us keep us going along. And, and, and Helen, you're you're next left going right to left. So um, you're in the middle of it all. I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, as well as um, the impact this conversation has on you. I needed to unmute first. Uh, um, thank you again, Dr. Sagru. I, this is my third time hearing you speak. I first heard you at U of M Dearborn, where they were using your book. And I went right out and bought it and learned a lot from it. Um, I feel like you've given me the tools to be an ambassador. Um, my parents raised me uh, to be an anti-racist, but, uh, and they did what they could while, while they were around. Um, but there's always so much to be learned and I learned a lot today. Um, one of the things that I thought of <clears throat> when you showed the photo of the uh, older housing stock and the problems, I've had a theory lately, I'd like your opinion on, that one of the problems is by the time a poor family can afford a house, the only house they can afford is already in such bad shape that they can't afford to fix it up. And so it continues to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. And yet people point to it and say, see, they don't take care of their property. Um, so that was one of my thoughts. Um, I also remembered um, back in my youth, the uh, matched pairs of matched couples that were sent out for rentals or purchases of housing to see what response they got. Uh, uh, two white people, two black people, a mixed race couple. And, and that gave rise to, as I recall, a whole bunch of laws uh, controlling uh, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and um, the other thing I wanted to say is that for people who don't know about him, look up Dr. Ossian Sweet, who was a doctor and he had to defend his property with a rifle standing on his porch. His home is now has a marker. I think it's on Charlevoix, um, mm -hmm. somewhere down past St. Jean. I don't remember exactly, I haven't been by recently, but uh, that's a very important story in our history too. And the last comment I wanted to make when you were talking about uh, college applications, <clears throat> one of the problems that the new generation is having with the uh, African style names that their parents have given them. It's a clear marker to anybody in a, looking at their college application as to what their culture is. Mm -hmm. And it, it provides a passive way of uh, restricting admissions if they want to. Great. So, but thank you very much. Every time I listen to you, I learn a lot more and get excited to go. I need to reread the book again for a third time. Oh, one other thing. We took the youth group on a mission trip to Detroit a few years ago. And one of the things we did was we took them to Burwood Wall, which I had never seen and had never heard about until I read your book. And uh, that's a dramatic lesson. So thank you very much.
Thanks, Ellen. I'm 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 glad you're a fan. Um, my book is my book came out. It's hard to believe almost 25 years ago, and um, it still gets used a lot in classes. And yeah. and you know, it's 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 and, and there's nothing that makes an author happier than um, you know. Um, not just shouting into the void, right? But you know, knowing that people are <laughs> still engaging and really um, grappling with the implications of my work. That said, I'd love my book to become like like superannuated and 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 doesn't you know you know we don't need it. Right. Anymore. One of the one of the hard things, right, about writing a, about a subject like this is, is the book is just as relevant as it was when I wrote it. Um, but, yes, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I'd love it to be like you know. Uh, we don't yep. need to do this anymore. It's just some dusty old past. Um, but uh, to, to your to your first point about um, housing and um, deterioration of housing, this is one of the most commonplace explanations, right? Look, I, I remember driving on actually with my mom when I was taking photographs from my first book, and uh, my mom, a native Detroiter, and uh, and she said, "Oh, this is so sad. Look, look what people people don't keep up their properties and." Um, and as I mentioned before, as, as someone who's lived in 100-year-old houses for most of my life, um, it takes a lot of money to keep these places standing. And they're, they're always, something's always going off, right? Mm -hmm. It breaks, you know, get, get scrappy, furnace needs to be replaced. And if you don't have the resources, um, yeah. uh, it, it, it can be a real, real challenge. And one of the main ways that people get resources to improve their homes is access to conventional mortgages or loans. And because of what I briefly skirted over in my talk, but the real difficulties in getting access to affordable loans for, for many African-Americans, even if you have the will, um, you don't often have the way to, 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 to do the really substantial work that needs to be done on many of these older properties to keep them standing or keep them well-maintained. And it doesn't take long for a house to show yeah. the signs of wear, especially if it's old. But what we do, because that's invisible, Right, we look at who we look at the visibility of the house. They don't keep up their properties, right? Not at all of the larger processes that are at work. Sure, there are some people who are neglectful and don't keep up their properties. Let's take that for granted. But to keep up your property requires more than just your being a good person. It requires you having access to resources to do so, and a lot. Yes. Um, in addition, many of the properties that have experienced serious decline are owned by absentee landlords who um, who milk them and don't keep them up, right? So that's another whole story. Again, mostly invisible because nobody knows who owns the property. You just look to see who's standing on the front lawn or who's, who's walking down the street and you make assumptions. But a lot of the deterioration in cities like Detroit and everywhere come from, from unscrupulous or exploitative investors who, um, who mm. don't keep the places up. So That's one of the reasons I'm very involved with Habitat for Humanity. We have a group out here from the churches called Habitat Gross Point Partners because Habitat tries to bridge that gap and get people started out with a house that's in prime condition. So they don't have the high uh, maintenance problems. So important, um, yeah. so, so important. I mean, I, 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 you know, I can't tell you how much money I spent on my wonderful 1915 house in Philadelphia where I lived for 20 years. It's an amazing house, but I spent so much money you know, keeping it shored up, um, even though it was maybe one of the best built houses anywhere in the world in terms of its solidity and its construction. And, and uh, um, wow, you know, I mean, uh, I had a very substantial income, uh, the resources to be able to do so. And even then I deferred some maintenance because it was so expensive. Um, so yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for your engagement. And it's a reminder, I guess my, the big takeaway point is we can't make assumptions based on what the owner of a property looks like and the maintenance or care of that property. We have to know a lot more. We have to look beyond what's visible to what's invisible because it's the invisible, as I told you with boundaries and everything else that helps us to understand why the inequalities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I wanna th thank you, Helen, for, th for those thoughts and, and insights and questions. I'd love to hear um, from, from Dave and, and Jean Redfield. Perhaps, I don't know if it's both of you today or if it's one or, <laughs> one or the other. So, um, but we'd love to hear from you guys. Go ahead. Well, maybe I'll make a quick comment and, and then- If I'm time sure, allows. If time allows, Jean can do. Um, I think a couple of things struck me, um, Professor Segru, and that is, Two things. First of all, maybe a kind of a hypothetical question is that I was, it was helpful for me in your book to see the 
economic forces at play around automation, um, the other forces around anti-union work that, that was trying to drive labor out of the cost of products and out of the cost of manufacture, which, which was then put together with the racial side that was going on also. So here's a hypothetical question. Let's say the racial part wasn't in play in Detroit. What, what might have happened to the city had that automation still progressed and there wasn't that other piece going on? Obviously, we don't know that, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. The second thing that came to mind was, I think we were talking about community and thinking about, and, and maybe it's on the hopeful side, although it's horrible. And that is Medgar Evers was shot in the dark at, at his home at night. Martin Luther King was shot in the daylight from a distance. Trayvon Martin was shot uh, in close proximity, but then George Floyd had a, we saw a person put his knee right on the person's throat. In a sense of this horror that's going on, are, is there some sort of progress that we're seeing there where folks are it's more, it's more visible now? I mean, you know, the, the Klan would ride around at night and it, cause it was a secret. It, George Floyd's death wasn't a secret to anyone. And yeah. maybe that's a tiny piece of hope, as horrible as it was. So, just those are a couple of thoughts that I had. And I don't know if you want to go ahead. So, just yeah. Oh, great question. Yeah. So, so let me begin with the um, the the auto industry one. Um, and and I'll say this: um, the collapse of the auto industry in Detroit. Um, was long in coming. It's a story that plays out over 60 years. And even in the boom period, the 1950s, right, when the country is riding high, where there's no international competition, Detroit loses between 1948 and 1963, about 130,000 auto industry jobs. Um, that's a lot of jobs, right? Oh, and, uh, and, and that was going to have devastating implications for, for anybody who worked in the industry, regardless of their racial background. Um, the, the, the thing is, African Americans um, were in the parts of the auto industry that were most vulnerable to job loss, right? So they're the, they're the, first, the, the first often to be fired. It's their sections of the plants that are likely to be shutting down. And the auto industry is moving to places with very few, for the most part, very few African Americans. And so they can't just pick up and, 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 and who wants to pick up and move to Memphis or, or you know, parts of the South? where a lot of the new auto jobs are, 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 are happening when you've just left there, your parents have just left there yeah. to escape the violence of Jim Crow, right? You came to Detroit because it was a land of hope. Uh, and now you're being said, well, if, you know, your best hope is to move to Atlanta or, or Memphis to follow the industry there. That's, that's not a really good path. And so, so I think the bigger point is, yes, it was devastating for everybody. Um, but whites had many more opportunities to find alternatives than African-Americans did because of deep discrimination in the market. Um, I could tell you a long story, but I won't, um, about my dad's experience um, uh, taking an auto industry job when he was right out of high school and, and he didn't like it, he quit, and he was able to find other jobs in ways that African Americans of his generation couldn't do. Um, the next point about, um, it's a really, um, really good question that you asked about, um, wait, remind me of the second part again, I know it was a really good question. The um, from the darkness and the invisibility. Oh, yeah, yeah, invisibility, right, yes. Um, so, um, look, things have changed since the 1960s. I mean, we saw 26 to 28 million people taking the streets around Black Lives Matter this summer, and not very many of them died, right? There were very few deaths. And while everyone's very gloomy about racial politics in the United States today, um, in Detroit, in 1967, over a period of six days, 43 people died, 34 of them at the hands of the police and the National Guard. So there have been changes, right? The police are terrible in, in many respects, but they're not as violent um, as they were um, 50 years ago. And that's because of lots and lots of pressure um, from activists and, and protesters. So things have changed. That said, um, we have a, 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 a terrible epidemic of police violence um, against um, 
against African Americans, but people in color generally, um, roughly 1,100 people dying every year at the hands of the police, um, most of them African American. Um, and, and the difference between 1967 and today is those violent incidents can be recorded on people's cell phones and broadcast widely um, and raise consciousness in a way that was harder to do. In fact, I, I told you, I, I mean, maybe doing a historical analogy, I told you when I wrote Origins of the Urban Crisis, I, I uncovered through lots of detective work, more than 200 violent racial incidents that happened targeting the first or second African-American families to move to all white neighborhoods in the city and in the suburbs. Now, I'm sure there are many, many more. Those were just the ones I found documentation for. Um, if, if you went to the Detroit Free Press or the Detroit News or the Detroit Times, an old paper that's now long gone, um, the daily newspapers and looked for those incidents, they weren't covered for the most part. They were invisible, right? They were totally invisible. Um, and uh, when I spoke uh, on my first speaking gig in Detroit after my book came out, um, I went to a Borders bookstore and I spoke to a big audience and there was a older white couple there and I described a, a racial incident that happened in their neighborhood on, on Detroit's east side. And he stood up and said, this never happened. Um, you're a liar. Um, Ethel, we're out of here. And they stood up and they stormed out of my talk, furious uh, at, what, at what they believed was my distortion of the past. When I speak to African-Americans, not every older African-American has a direct story, but many of them have at least an indirect story. Oh, that story you told my aunt when she moved into such and such a neighborhood, this happened to her, or my cousin's experience is kind of, right? So, so what, 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 what didn't happen in the 1940s and 1950s was making visible of what was invisible to many people. What's happening today around policing is what has been going on horrifically for a really long time as part of the everyday experience of many African-Americans um, is now being made visible. And, and that, and we need to to make visible what is invisible. If I were to say, what's one principle? Why I do what I do? Why I write the books I do? Why I give talks about this stuff and why I teach about it? Is my task is to use my skills as a storyteller, as a historian, as a social scientist to make the invisible visible. Because we're not going to ever make any changes or improve our society if these practices remain hidden. Um, as they did in the case of people engaging in violence under the cover of darkness or attacking the first African-American family and the only people who knew about it were the near neighbors or the African-American press did cover these things. So if you read the black papers, you'd, you'd know about many of these incidents, but you wouldn't know about it if you read the white papers or watch the evening news. Could I add something here? Uh, you reminded me about the blockbusting that went on um, and that was vicious. My mother would receive piles of postcards every day, and they were all along the lines of sell before it's too late. Um, your neighborhood is changing. And she refused to leave. Uh, but that came constantly, constantly. Once they finally sold the first house, um, they gave that person a fairly good amount of money to sell. And then they sold to a black family. And then suddenly, when everybody else decided they wanted to sell, the prices dropped. Mm -hmm. So they suckered it, uh, you know, it was just so obvious. And my mother stayed there till the day she uh, moved out of the house to go into a nursing home uh, and had my a great relationship with all of her neighbors. My parents had a very similar story um, when they, when um, uh, in the years before they moved um, from Detroit to Farmington, um, besieged by phone calls from real estate brokers saying, sell now. Um, they resisted for a time, but eventually succumbed. Um, but there is one real estate broker now deceased that my mom had, had commissioned to help them look for houses. And when, when she started getting <clears throat> solicitations from him and his firm, she dropped him like a hot potato. She was furious at his mm -hmm. role in blockbusting. But it was a great way to make a profit, right? And so much of the story, again, it's, 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 not, it's, it's about race, racism and racial prejudice, but it's also about self-interest and exploitation. So much of the blockbusting that you're describing that my parents experienced were getting scared whites to sell cheap to speculators who would then sell high to African-Americans because black folks wanted to live in neighborhoods that they knew had better services, that were better maintained, that weren't rampant with absentee landlords, et cetera, better schools. Um, and they were willing to pay a premium to move in. The first African-American family to move into my block in Northwest Detroit, whose kids were my best friends when I was in elementary school, um, 
he was a Detroit police officer. She was a public school teacher. They had two incomes, which most of the residents of our neighborhood didn't. And they were able to afford, a, pay a premium to live in that neighborhood. Um, and uh, um, that was pretty typical. The first uh, many African-American families to move into formerly all white neighborhoods, they often were better off than the whites um, who lived in the neighborhoods that they were moving into because they had to pay a premium because of blockbusters mm -hmm. charged by the price. So if anybody ever says, if anybody ever tells you it's all the free market, right? It's all individual choice. Tell them, stop right there. Um, <laughs> it's such a compelling framework. Americans just believe it in their guts, right? But, but it's one of those gut feelings that has no resemblance to the reality. And part of my job is to make that reality visible. Sorry, um, um, I, was, I interrupted. No, I'm not, not at all. I was not just going to make a comment. Um, this is Jean. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Loved your book. It came to me probably 10 or 15 years ago through a 20-something year old colleague of mine who, who used it as a course book. And I, since then, it's been really, really helpful in terms of creating, a, helping me um, with, with just more awareness. A um, couple of themes came out for me. One was the one that you just hit on, this idea that people are making, are making decisions based on choice. White people make decisions based on choices because we have them. The systems make it so people of color actually don't have the same choices. And I think that's one of the things that really came through to me as you listed out the 10 different ways that people of color do not have the same choices that we do. And I think that's one of the really important frameworks that we as white people need to get in our heads is this, I, this myth that this is a choice-based, opportunity-driven culture. For mm -hmm. us, it is. For everybody else, it isn't. Mm -hmm. The other thing that came to mind was this idea of community with its boundaries. Um, through a, a cont contemplative prayer group that we participate in, we explored one of John O'Donohue's readings about, or writings about thinking about, instead of boundaries, thresholds. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to think about our, what we perceive as community boundaries as actually thresholds to new communities and new ways of being together? And it's been with me for a couple of weeks now about, you know, can we actually um, convert our hearts so that what used to be boundaries become thresholds too? And it sounds like you and your family have been very intentional about that in the way you, the communities you've chosen to be a part of in the schools as community that you've chosen to be a part of. So um, that was another thing that kind of hit me in your, in your conversation this morning. So thank you. I love that metaphor of boundaries and thresholds. That's, that's so powerful. Um, uh, it's, it's actually also a really great um, example of the ways in which um, what you're doing in, in one uh, important part of your life can have an impact on how you think about other parts of your life. Uh, that's, that's really great. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow it and, and, and use it actually <laughs> to talk about boundaries um, because really, in some ways, everything I've done in my entire career as a scholar and as a citizen, as an activist, uh, has been trying to break down those boundaries and think about ways to connect and tie together what might not be tied together. Um, um, I'm, I've never been one of those college professors that goes in with the idea to, to my students that I have this one truth, right? This one, you know, that you must absorb from me and learn. I try to give them the tools to cross those boundaries, right? By challenging their assumptions and, and preconceptions, but, but, you know, but listening at the same time. And I think it's that, that process of boundary crossing and, and boundary building is, is one that constantly requires um, thinking about the thresholds and not just thinking about, um, are you with me or are you against me, right? Um, but rather, how can we cross over and learn across these these often very hard and fast boundaries. Special. I, I, I love recommend it. John O'Donohue's essay. It's a really wonderful piece about how do you um, experience. <clears throat> wonderful. I'm, I'm so, I, I, it's, it's great. I always, I always learn something from my audiences and I've learned a lot from what you've all asked and, and, and said. Um, and this is one that, that now I'm only gonna learn from it, but I'm gonna figure out a way to drop it into my conversations <laughs> with people <laughs> in the future. Um, they borrow away, Oscar Wilde said, Talent borrows, genius steals. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. May I make one last comment too? I was suddenly remembered in this conversation. Uh, when we moved in here, we had trouble. The bank wouldn't give us a mortgage. Uh, 
my ex-husband was uh, from Guatemala, Mayan Indian. And um, fortunately, we found a judge here in Gross Point who helped us arrange a land contract instead. But this was a couple of years after the court decision ending the uh, uh, covenant restrictions here in Gross Point. Um, a few years, maybe three or four years later, but we had problems and we had problems socially too. So um, it's very hard to root this out and yeah. make an effect a real change. Um, I, I, I lived in Philadelphia. Um, I taught at the University of Pennsylvania for 24 years before moving to NYU. And uh, I lived in this amazing neighborhood called Mount Airy, which is in the northwest section of the city. And it's got a long history of largely church-based um, grassroots activism to create an alternative to racial segregation. And the number of stories, like the story that you tell, um, Helen, uh, um, that, I, that I heard in meeting with and conversing with my neighbors over the years is, um, um, you know, a reminder, this is still, this is not past, right? This is this is in the lifetimes of, of, of many of us, and it's still ongoing for, um, for, for lots of people. Um, and so that, again, making, making those stories um, public, um, having them known, um, making them visible is such an important part of the work that we're all doing. Mm. Well, Professor, I have uh, the unenviable task of, of drawing rich conversations to, to a conclusion, and this is certainly one um, that we could continue now. And uh, fortunately, friends, we will continue uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, next week, we, we have our annual meeting. So I, I hope you will all join us uh, for, for that. Uh, it will be a very different conversation, a different sacred conversation, though. Uh, but the series of sacred conversations will pick up on the 7th of February, as we turn our attention um, to, to the contemporary world, um, the, the, the tragic divisions that continue to exist uh, in our society today. We'll be fortunate to join, be joined by uh, Chuck Winder, excuse me, Chuck Winder, who is chaplain and teacher at uh, St. Paul's uh, School in Concord, New Hampshire. And he was formerly, before moving up to, to Concord, uh, the officer for social justice and engagement in the presiding bishop's office uh, of the Episcopal Church. So Chuck will be with us to explore the tragic divisions of American society today. Uh, so, so I hope you'll bring, um, uh, bring your coffee uh, and bring your questions and engage with us as we continue to hold these uh, sacred conversations uh, together. Um, uh, real quick, Jean, would you send out the link or, or title to, to the article that uh, or the, the, the reflection that you were sharing? Uh, I think we'd all enjoy reading that uh, and uh, uh, drawing that language into our um, vernacular, shall we say. Sure, uh, I'm just looking up the link now, so I'll put great. it in the chat. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, maybe I'll make one last highlight, and then, and, and then, Professor, I'm going to turn it back to you t um, for a, for a final word for us. Um, you know, early on, what 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 you did for us is to to draw out how a a a, a collective system um, and uh, worked against a particular people. Um, I, I, if, I, if I may draw that, that language again, a bootlegger, a madam, a gangster, and a colored man, a form of blight. Um, suddenly, um, uh, the, a whole society, uh, a whole community is, um, is both stigmatized um, uh, for all American society. Mm -hmm. And yet, we look at the a singular home and we say to the homeowner, they're not doing their part. That is to say, we personalize the solution to a, a social systematic problem. And we have to realize that um, it is not, it, the solutions to the problems of racism are not individual solutions. Uh, we cannot look at, as Jean was saying, we cannot simply look at a home that is falling apart and say, well, that's a bad homeowner. It is a result or an uneducated child, or I mean, it, the ors go on and on. Um, we have to look at 
the systems of our of our community and our society and our role within them, uh, the ways we either actively or pro probably more often passively benefit from the structures of society today. Uh, and we have to be willing to challenge those structures, which also means being uh, willing to give up some of the privileges we have inherited. Um, and uh, as, as, as you pointed out for us, the privileges we have hoarded uh, for white America today. I, I think this is an immensely challenging um, place for us to be uh, and a critical role for us um, to play uh, as a church, both for our members that our children, as well as our adult members um, are raised to to see, as we've been speaking about, to see the problems of society, but also have to have a heart uh, for change in society today. Um, so I look forward to, to these continued uh, conversations as I think they're uh, central to who we are. Professor, I said, I want to give you the last word. and I, I want to in, invite you to do something you said you never do, which is, what is your one truth? Um, you know, <laughs> you, you've, I will take anything you want to offer us, but I want to give you the, the opportunity to, to remind us or to share with us what you hope we take away from this conversation today. Um, well, in, in many respects, your last very eloquent comments summarized my big takeaway. Um, I think it's really important for us to not make the assumption that changing individual hearts and minds is going to solve the problem. We have to think more systemically. Um, in other words, our education and our individual reframing of, uh, of, of our relationship to the system is essential, but we have to do something with that, right? Um, so many people say or think, I'm not a racist, and I believe them. I think lots of lots of people um, aren't racists um, at, at, at core. I think most people are good, um, but changing your heart and your mind is necessary, but not sufficient. And we need to think about the larger um, political, public policy, and institutional questions that are at the core of the problem. Um, both in terms of understanding it, as you eloquently pointed out, right, that we can't just say it's all individual failure, that um, people are poor or that houses aren't maintained or that school outcomes are, are bad. We have to think about the larger systems that, that, that give people less opportunity. Um, but we also have to think about how our good feelings and our, our goodwill um, needs to be mobilized and turned into something bigger. All significant social change in American history happens um, because people act together collectively, moving towards a common goal. Um, lots of the sum of individual actions doesn't add up to large scale change. We need to think about um, collaborating, working collectively. And that, that, that takes organizing and it takes a lot of work. But the, the, the walls of discrimination that have fallen in the United States didn't happen just because all of a sudden the shingles fell from the eyes of, of other, you know, of, of racists. It happened because people put pressure on the system, made the laws change, um, pushed hard, upset a lot of people, turned over a lot of apple carts, um, but in the process um, opened up the doors that have been opened. I didn't spend enough time talking about that, but we have to talk about and thinking about civil rights. Um, the victories of the civil rights struggle. And remember, it wasn't just a tired woman who gave up her seat on the bus. It was all the people with her and behind her um, working to put pressure on the political system, um, protesting and picketing and getting arrested that were responsible for those changes as well. Um, and it was educators and it was ministers and it was you know a lot of people working collectively towards a common goal. We need to do that and we need to think more in that way if we're going to ever succeed in overcoming the racial barriers that I've described today. So I guess I'll end with that. Nope, you're muted. I know, there it was. We, we knew we were gonna get it somewhere in the day. Um, for, I, I can't thank you enough for, for, for that final re reminder, um, but also for your conversation and insights um, that you have offered to us throughout this morning's conversation. Uh, and so I'm sure on behalf of everyone here- thank
thank you for for bringing uh, your wisdom to our our computers and our, and, and our homes. Uh, I can see uh, folks are, are, are clapping, um, know our appreciation uh, from afar. And, and along, uh, in line with that, thanks. I wanted to thank Walter uh, for your, um, your partnership in helping to make these conversations uh, possible throughout this year. It's been a, it's been a wonderful journey uh, and I look forward to its continuation. Again, uh, friends, we're gonna pick up our sacred conversations on the 7th of February. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all here uh, as part of that um, uh, in, in the weeks to come. Again, Professor, thank you. Uh, Walter, thank you. And, and everyone, thank you for, for being a part of this conversation today. Thank, thank you, you too. Um, thank you for your engagement. Uh, I really appreciate it. It was, uh, it was a real pleasure to be here with you today. Thank and you. Remarkable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Really well done, Doctor. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, friends. God bless everyone. God bless you all.